Have you ever wondered why some solopreneurs seem to effortlessly achieve their business goals while others tend to struggle to make progress? Well, today we are diving into the world of goal setting and business success with my guest, a seasoned expert in helping solopreneurs turn their dreams into reality. So stay tuned to discover the secret behind setting and reaching your business goals and how you can unlock your full potential as a solopreneur. Hi, I'm Jen Vasquez. Using my proven Pinterest marketing method, I help hyper busy female service providers create one marketing workflow to book more clients and increase their income and impact in about an hour a week. If marketing is something that you really really want to learn more about for your business, we would love for you to subscribe on YouTube or to the podcast channel. Today, oh, I am so excited to be chatting with Sarah Duran of Fruition Initiatives. Sarah is the founder of Fruition Initiatives, and she is an operational expert who has spent over a decade helping people and organizations turn their ideas into action. On top of her business strategy expertise, she's also a coach who helps solopreneurs live up to their highest potential. She takes her expertise as a consistent six-figure freelancer and combines it with her background in curriculum design facilitation, and coaching to give solopreneurs the support to get what they need out of every single workday. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. So let's dive right into the first question, which is never a surprise to my listeners or watchers. I would love to find out sort of how you started working, what jobs came before, and kind of how you got to your business today. Absolutely. I love this question. So I actually started my career as a teacher. I taught third grade. And after being a teacher, I worked for a variety of educational nonprofits. So I've always operated and to a certain extent still operate in a K-12 education space. And so about going on 10 years now, I had gotten the best job I had ever had. I had checked all the boxes I could check for myself working for other people. I thought I had figured it out. And I still, for some reason, wasn't happy. It wasn't doing it for me. And so I ended up quitting that job. I had to figure out something different. I started getting my real estate license at the time. I also ended up picking some contract work up for folks that I had been working for before in sort of the K-12 like nonprofit space. Lo and behold, the real estate wasn't the best fit for me, but the contract work ended up really taking off. About a year into that, I realized that that was what I was supposed to do. And that's why I incorporated my company. And so from there on out, I guess, as they would say, the rest is history. Very, very cool. I, I tend to hear that a lot of coaches started off as teachers because you've got great experience educating kids. So there is a little bit of an extension in terms of educating adults, right? Certainly yeah, patience absolutely. is one of those. <laughs> Yes, oh. uh, my my eight year olds take like definitely patience. My eight year olds and my my adult learners take a combination of some of the same methods and some of the some different ones. Absolutely, want to dive right in because I'm really excited to get to this. I have a lot of people asking for help in this area, so I was really excited to have you on. Can you share some insights on how solopreneurs can effectively set and achieve their business goals? Considering their unique position as one person operations, you know, we talk about wearing all the hats and like oftentimes, you know, marketing and stuff can fall to the wayside because we're just like having such a hard time. So I think my answer to that actually goes like a couple steps before you're even setting a goal. The place that I always start with the people that I work with is having them think really deeply about who they are, why they do their work and what they want to get out of it. Because I feel like a lot of us end up setting goals, myself included, that 
aren't actually connected to the to the deeper things that we want out of our businesses. We don't do some of the hard work needed to actually even think about what we want in a deep way and then connect that sort of to an overarching strategy. And so I think that is the first one is like just get deep with yourself <laughs> to start with about first, who are you? So like that is everything from like your strengths and weaknesses to your values. Like who are you? Why do you do your work? What do you need to get from your work? Whether that's time, money, flexibility. I think that calculus sort of looks different for everyone. I think we all definitely want to get money out of our businesses, but we all also have different things in addition to that that we want to get, whether that's we want to be working less hours or we want to be able to travel or whatever that might look like. And then the third piece is really the want. Using those first two things as a foundation, really thinking deeply about what do you want out of your work and life? So what does it need to give you? And then I think we're at a place where we can build goals and even to a certain extent, build a business model based on all of those things so that your business is giving you exactly what you need. Then when it comes straight to the goal setting piece of it, so once you've sort of done that work and you understand where you want to go, what you want to achieve, there's a couple of pillars that I like to focus on. The first one is making sure that we're not setting long-term goals. So I do not believe in long-term goals at all. Hallelujah. In- <laughs> hallelujah. I'm like the longest goal. I have something in my head, you know, for five years or whatever, but I'm quarterly by quarterly planner yes. and then break it down monthly and daily. So I, that's just music to my ears. Yeah, that is exactly the method that I go for. So I think we can have like a longer term vision. Yes. But even that, I think we've all learned very clearly <laughs> over the last three to four years that things can change pretty rapidly. Yeah, on a really and big scale, a change on a really yeah. big scale. <laughs> Right, which then filters down into sort of, you know, the things on the macro level always filter down into our own lives. And I think that's like a wake up call that has that like that's actually always been true. So I don't know about anyone else, but usually when I set a goal or especially when I used to work for other people and we had to do like a annual goal setting process, they sit on a shelf, you come back to them in a year and feel like a failure. Yeah, you feel like a fail. So either you haven't achieved it you feel like a failure. They're completely irrelevant because everything around the goal has shifted or you've blown it out of the water. And it was like not not even like a a strenuous enough goal to set in the first place. So I think that's the first one is really just thinking about goals as as short term, short to medium term goals with a longer term vision. And I also ask people to set qualitative goals instead of quantitative goals. So I think we all get told that the way to set goals is quote unquote smart goals that have these metrics that you can measure with numbers. And numbers are great. And I think numbers are important. But I actually think that goals work a lot better when we do the hard work of thinking about what success looks and feels like Mm. and not a number. So not saying I want to make 100K by the end of next year, but really thinking about what does 100K do for my life? What does 100K look like and feel like? And then you're focusing on that feeling. You're focusing on what it gives you instead of focusing on the number because you may achieve those things and be at 80K or be at 150K if you didn't quote unquote hit your goal, but you still have gotten to the qualitative measures of what that meant for your life, then you've succeeded, even if you didn't hit the number. Brilliant. I totally agree with that 100%. We always want these measurable goals because that's what we're all taught. And like you said, having some of them, there's a place for them, especially in marketing, to make sure that that time, energy, and effort you're spending on a platform is showing results, right? But when it comes to business goals, I think it is totally different. And I, I agree with you. Like I I have one whole day a week I spend just playing with my grandbabies. And if I'm not able to do that, I have not succeeded. I don't care what my business goals are because that's what I need in my life, right? So mm-hmm. I totally get it. What strategies or approaches do you recommend for solopreneurs looking to strike a balance between growth, but also maintaining? a sustainable workload. So I think a lot of that goes back to sort of the why you do your work and what you need to get out of it. So sometimes we're all chasing a number, chasing a dollar amount, chasing a full workload because that validates us. It sort of reminds us of what it felt like when we work for other people. We're sort of still living according to those rules of 
a 40 hour work week or a six figure salary. And so I think getting really clear with yourself about the time, like to your example, a four a four day work week, the time you want to be spending and the amount of money you want to be making is the first one. And then I think there's ways to do the math between those two to figure out what you should be charging. Not that everyone is charging hourly, but I think having having an hourly amount in the back of your head helps you do the math no matter what you do about the value of your time and how that's being translated into the people that you work for. So I think that's the first one is just not to get caught up in the definition of success that I think society wants us to see, but really defining success for ourselves from the beginning. And that allows us to then really pay attention and use our own criteria for deciding how we spend our time and the types of clients and projects and products and services that we take on. Because all of those things should be informed by the the way that your business model is supporting your life. And so I think that's the first one is let's just not get caught up in like chasing work for the sake of chasing work or chasing money for the sake of chasing money. Let's do it because it actually gives us something different. And then I think that like that first criteria actually really helps you tease things out where you're like, okay, I only have four days a week. What I the amount of money I need, like bare minimum to be running my life is X. And so what does that mean for what I need to be bringing in? And how is that changing my products and services? I think the other one is that you have to then think about I mean, this is turning into a little bit of an explanation about pricing, but that's we'll okay. Just go, there. go there. You have to then think about your pricing and your the money that you're bringing in for your business like a business. So I think a lot of solopreneurs get stuck into a mindset where they are still thinking of themselves as an employee to a certain extent because they are single operators. They end up nickel and diming themselves with their clients and customers. And so I think taking your time and money into consideration first and then doing the math of like, what does that need for what I'm bringing in? Plus, when you're doing a budget or projections for your business, what does that mean for PTO that I want to be taking? What does that mean for insurance that I need to be paying for? What does that mean for the professional development I need to continue to grow as a business owner? And factoring that all into the prices that you're charging your customers so that at the end of the day, you're not making enough money to just survive. You're making enough money to support yourself just like everyone else who works for other people gets to support themselves with paid time off and insurance and professional development and all the others. Making sure that you're really thinking about yourself as a business, which is reflected in your pricing and is also reflected in the way that then you're shaping your offerings and what you do for your work around that initial calculus. That is a really amazing explanation. I haven't quite heard it said that way, and yet that's how my mind works. If I'm not happy in the life I'm living, the time that I'm spending, and if I'm not making enough money for the life that I'm living, then there's no happiness. And you know, you can lessen your expenses, or you can mm-hmm. increase your prices, or you can change your offerings. Like there's three yep. ways to come about it. And it's and because you're the business owner, you get to decide how that works. I think that's, that's right. so amazing. In your experience, what are some common challenges that solopreneurs face when it comes to managing their time and prioritizing their goals? And how can they maybe overcome these challenges? I mean, there's so many. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know. So I, it's a very wide question. So whatever yes. pops up into your head first, I know will really give some value. Okay. So I would say the first thing about managing your time is again, like breaking free of the mindset that your time has to look like it did when you worked for other people. So I think not thinking about your time in like a nine to five, five day work week is the first one. We all have other constraints in our lives, um, children, grandchildren, partners, others. So it's not that we are the only people in control of the way we spend our time. But I think that you now have a power to cultivate the conditions that you need for your best work and then do your work when those conditions are right. And so for some people, that might mean you're keeping like 
a more regular schedule. You're working at night or you're working super early in the morning. For some people, I think those conditions can be the place where you're doing your work. A lot of us work from home. Sometimes I need to like go to a coffee shop if I need to like really be heads down and focused on something. And so I think those are just two examples of really thinking about the conditions. And then I think the other one, which is just always the hardest one for solopreneurs, and it is it is a constant balancing act that you will face for the rest of your career. So you solve it, and then you solve it, and then you solve it. (laughs) It doesn't get easier. But it is focusing on the work that only you can do. And that factors back it, both into like business model and offerings, but also f- factors back into the money that you're making. And so if you need to be on a social media platform because of the type of work that you do, and that's where you find your customers, but you hate doing that, then you need to figure out the calculus so someone else can do it for you. You can also think about changing your offering so that you're doing more of the things that you can do. This is something I think it's really common as we get into our like third, fourth, fifth, sixth year of being a business owner, where you start to get more and more clear of this is the thing that I'm supposed to be doing. This is my zone of genius. This is the work I'm supposed to be doing. But as most business owners, you're good at lots of things. And sometimes your clients draw you into doing lots of things. And so there, yep, there comes a point for everyone where you have to be like, okay, I'm not going to do those things anymore. And if it's client work, then you have to reshape your offerings and reshape your relationships with your clients to be like, I don't do that anymore. You will have to find someone else to do that thing. This is the thing that I do. And simultaneously, you're now positioning that to new clients in a different way, positioning yourself differently than you did when you brought on previous clients. I think those are those are two off the top of my head. Uh, like my, I think those are my my top two for yeah. uh, time. And I, and I think another thing that came up for me was I'm very passionate about Pinterest and I wanted to be able to help more people and I can't add more time to my schedule. That's already set for me. So I added a membership where I can help more people at maybe Mm -hmm. a lower price point than my one-on-ones, but I'm still only spending the same amount of time for all of those people, which in turn will bring in more money because I can add more people to that without having to expand the hours that I'm working. Like there's always ways to think outside the box because we are the entrepreneur. We get to choose how we do our work and how we deliver that. So it doesn't always have to be one-on-one services or it doesn't have to be memberships if that's too much for you as well. Like it's whatever you decide, but don't, like you were mentioning earlier, don't only think of it like an employee working for a company because we have the ability to do whatever we want to do. Yep. I love I that. I could not have said I could not have said it better myself. I, I mean you say did. That time you is- led me there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I always say that time is finite, but money is not. So when you work for yourself, money is actually not fine. You can and let you does it take trade-offs and you know yeah key decisions about, again, how do you want to spend your life? But depending on what you're willing and able to do, money is not finite. And so you can always figure out a different way to design your business. I think that is a perfect example so that you're still helping people. You're helping even more people. Yeah. And your time is still the same. And you've and you've figured out the financial calculus to make it work. Exactly. So can you provide some examples of specific goal setting techniques or frameworks that really have been particularly effective for entrepreneurs that you work with? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, so- and we're not like saying exactly step by step what goes on. So just <laughs> I'm not asking you to give a free education right here at this second, but I, (laughs) but I do think that you come at it from a different perspective than others that I've spoken with. And I, I want to make sure, especially for the podcast and YouTube channel, like I just want every solopreneur out there to be able to have different, hear about different ways of doing things that could be effective for them in their business. Definitely. So, I mean, I think we've already hit on a couple of them. I think doing that work in the front end and using that, the the like who, why, want work in the front end, using that to establish a vision for yourself about what you want to be getting out of your business, what you want your business to look like in a qualitative way. Then You're setting sort of the way I usually do it is I set quarterly milestones. So I will set milestones for like 
up to six, like up to a year, six months to a year quarterly. Uh, but I'm only similar to what you said, planning out 90 days in advance. And then I'm breaking that down into the months. So I'm like, what do I want to accomplish in Q1? What does that mean for January, February, March? But the trick is that you have to have a system for revisiting it regularly. If you're not, it can't be like those goals that you did your an annual performance review with your manager way back when, and they just sat on a shelf. Well, you for never a year. looked at them for yeah. the whole year, literally. Exactly. So you have to have, and this is part of, I think, the like mindset shift about working on your business and not just in your business. You have to have these regular touch points with yourself, whether it's a meeting on your calendar, hopefully it is a meeting on your calendar because or else it gets, you know, taken away where you're doing at least at the bare minimum, you're monthly revisiting those goals and adjusting them. Because again, things change. They are not like it is not going to be the same. Really checking back on those and being like, is this still the right thing? What did I accomplish last month? What needs to roll forward? What needs to go away? Um, and don't I be always, afraid of I that. Because don't be afraid I mean, of that. I, I've reinvented my business so many times. I mean, not fully, but like the way that I work and the, the goal setting and this, that and the other. And I'll look back on some of it and think, wow, that's crazy that I thought that was so important. Like you don't know yes. necessarily what's important when you're just starting out. So if you're new, this is a heads up for you guys. Don't feel like frustrated because you don't know what you don't know yet. So just make some goals according to the advice that you're getting right now, quarterly. And then Mm -hmm. I bet after three or four quarters, you're going to be so much more dialed in than anyone that yes. does annual goals. I ju I'll just say that. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely right. Be I think you said it, it perfectly because you don't know in year one what you're going to know in year three, what you're going to know in year five or year seven. And so you can't you because you can't predict the future and because like future you is going to know a lot more than present you you have to just be able to um the analogy i sometimes use is like following the breadcrumbs where you're just like okay like this is the next thing i know what i'm going to do next month or i know what i'm going to do next quarter i don't actually sometimes you do depending on what you're planning but it's like, I don't actually know what's going to happen after that. Like, I need to do this next thing. I'm going to see what happens from that thing. And then I'm going to know what to do to plan the next thing. And the other technique that I like to use, which is there, depending on what you call it, is either a pickle jar or a backlog. A pickle jar is, I think, a David Allen thing from getting things done. Or project managers call it a backlog if you're designing like software or something like that. And that's a place where you keep the ideas that you want to get to, but you can't. Now is not the right time. Oh. So... Yes. So you have to keep them somewhere, but you can't get distracted by them because as business people, we all, we have tons of amazing ideas. And when you don't put them somewhere where they can like live safe and sound until their time comes, you can't, you, you get distracted by them. And so you have to be able to have a place where you're like, okay, now is not the time. I don't know when the time is, but I'm going to put this over here and I'm going to hold on to it. And then again, make sure that you're checking your pickle jar. So I check my pickle jar quarterly, not monthly, but having a place where your brain children can live <laughs> until you're ready to bring them out into the world. Yeah. And I, and I love Asana for this because it's free, mm -hmm. especially for solopreneurs. It's really nice, even if you're by yourself. And then when you do have a team at some point, you can add them in. But I always have like, the first thing I see is my goal for the month. I can always check on my quarterly goals as well. And then I have my, I, I don't remember what I call it, like wish list, dream list, whatever. I've got my marketing retreat on there. I've got like all these things that I went, but I know that that's not where I need to focus because there's mm -hmm. things that you need to focus on for what you are making money for right now. And some of these big ideas are really exciting and they're more fun sometimes to work on, but are they going to be bringing you in business right now and that may not be where you need to be focusing so and you can do that with your quarterly milestones too where it's like i know i'm gonna launch this thing in q4 yes but it is q1 and so i'm gonna put it over there i know it's gonna be there when i get to q2 or q3 i'll start thinking about it but like i'm just gonna put it over there for now 
And I'm going to let it live there while I concentrate on this thing. Well, and also using your quarterly or monthly goal, let's say, Mm -hmm. and breaking it down further into weekly goals, I find makes it seem less overwhelming, right? There's this whole hustle culture where everyone wants to be so busy and they love to say they're busy. That's like the sign of a successful company. And I'm over here thinking I'm everyone's busy. I know exactly what I'm doing and I'm going to take step by step because that's going to get me to my monthly goal. And then my monthly goal is going to get me to my quarterly goal. So I don't want to think about all those things over there or that's when most entrepreneurs get overwhelmed. Yep. I think that is 100% <laughs> true. I am a project manager by trade. Yeah. And so <laughs> that is that is what I do is I break things down. I take, start with the end in mind and then I break things down all the way down to yeah. what needs to, to all the tasks that need to happen. All the way so, down to blocking yes. time on your calendar. Everyone knows listening that I am a block time on your calendar kind of girl or stuff will not get done for me at least. Yep. So let me, because we focus primarily on marketing and I find that goals are super important to marketing. So what mistakes do you see solo t- entrepreneurs making when they're marketing, but in regards to goal setting in mind. So in other words, people have these big goals, but marketing are sometimes these smaller steps that get you to those goals. So what are some mistakes that you see solopreneurs making? Oh, that's a great question. (laughs) So I would say that it is probably the thing that we just talked about where you are not breaking it down into the smaller pieces and really understanding the work that needs to happen to put to get those smaller pieces into place. Because I think, and it goes back to the numerical goals, and I don't disagree with you at all that I think numerical goals are important for marketing. But saying that I want, you know, 10,000 followers next month when you have (laughs) 1,000 followers next month is A, not feasible, or even 10,000 followers by the end of the year. (laughs) So let's say that's your goal. Breaking it down into like, okay, what are the increments of that? And like, what does it actually look like? to get to the next level and the next level and the next level. And then I would say too, like, I also think it still goes back to some of the key things that we talked about in the beginning where it's like, what are you willing to do? Because I think a lot of our business models, I run in, I bump up against a lot of freelancers who are like, I need to have a bigger social media presence. I need to have, and I'm like, maybe, I don't know. Like, what, what do you, what do you want to do? Who are your people? Who do you like? I don't, I I think we're all told that that's true. And sometimes it for sure is true, but I I think it all goes back to like, what do you want to get out of your business? And I think for some people, it's like, that can't be the way I sell my stuff. And so I need to do something that isn't dependent on that, whatever that is. Yes. So I think it is like really thinking about who you are and what you're willing to do to sell your business, um, to sell whatever you're selling to your clients. But I would say specifically for goals and for marketing, it is about breaking it down into the smaller pieces and I and backwards mapping it. I don't think that everyone is always great. This is just the way my brain works because yeah. I'm a project manager, but really being like, this is where I want to be by the end of the quarter. And so what does that mean for all the steps that need to come before that? And if once you backward map it, you might be like, oh, yeah, there's no way I can do this in a quarter. I'm going to need six months. Like, yes. So I think instead it's just of getting waiting and feeling steps. like a failure because you're not Superman, yes. like it's just not a possible sometimes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And I will say too, like, With social media, especially with goals like you're talking about followers and things like that, I mean, last I checked, there's like, you maybe will have 3% growth. 3% is, you know, maybe 3% of people are even seeing your content too. So you Mm -hmm. can't be making these big lofty goals when it's not, it's not even possible. And the majority of your clients are going to probably come from your email list anyway. Like you, that, true. that's why I like to say to, for marketing, you want these measurable goals that you can see where people are coming from. And when you see in a month that more people are coming from your email list or Pinterest or wherever than Instagram, then why are we spending 20% of our day on Instagram? And we end up scrolling like it's entertainment, right? I'm not saying not to be on Instagram by no means. But what I am saying is when you have business goals, 
those business goals get should be broken down into marketing goals. Time, how much time are you spending on each platform? Only make that decision once you know what type of traffic those platforms are sending you and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like it, 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 they so go hand in hand. Even my Pinterest strategy starts with your business goal. I ask mm -hmm. everyone, what is your quarterly goal? What do you want to accomplish in a quarter? A, I get to find out if people have such lofty ideas that Pinterest is not going to solve them. Uh, maybe ads will solve them, but Pinterest may not be <laughs> the one that says solves them. Plus, how long have you been on there? How long have you been using it? Like every marketing strategy should always start with your marketing or your quarterly business goals and the time you have to give, because that's going to decide how much you can show up and then figure out how you're going to put that into action, period. So they go, in my opinion, they go super hand in hand. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. So what three things do you think have helped you to grow your business? This could be anything from tools to advice or anything in terms of growing your business. So I would say the number one thing, and honestly, this might be number one, two, and three, but <laughs> the, number no, one thing that has, <laughs> the number one thing that has helped me grow my business is relationships. So yes. I think no matter your marketing method, you have to be building relationships, whether that's direct, depending on what you're selling, depending on what you do, all this, like, know your sector, know your audience, know your business. You're, you are building relationships with e your, uh, your ideal clients, with people who already serve your ideal clientele. Um, so other like adjacent type of businesses yes. who are also operate. With so them. many people You're don't also do that. I, amen. Say it again for those in the back. <laughs> build relationships with adjacent people to the who also serve your clientele. The other one that is a amen that that even less people do is you need to build relationships with your competitors. Yes. Um yes. not just and I say competitors, I'm going to put it in quotation marks because it when you're a solopreneur there is a if you're good at what you do there is there is more than enough work and clients to go around. So I like to think of them more as colleagues. And this is the number one thing I get pushback on with the people that I coach where I'm like, you need to go have conversations with five of your competitors. Like you just need to, you need to have a relationship with them because we are single person businesses. And even when you stratify and have passive income sources and do all the other things, fundamentally, A, we're businesses of one. And two, we, we if we are super concentrated on the specific people we are here to serve, you are going to get people in your audience that are not your people and who are like, hey, like to your point, maybe Pinterest isn't the thing. And so it's like if you have people in your back pocket that you can say like, hey, I might not be the coach for you, but I have this great person who does something very similar and I think they're the one. And that means that when someone comes to that person's door and they're like, hey, I might not be the coach for you and they're going to refer them your way. And so I think just having a more of a collaborative, cooperative mindset instead of a competitive mindset. Um, so maybe that is three, three types of relationships that you should have. I, I totally agree with you. And I feel like even the word competitor really irritates me <laughs> because yep. I, I, I am in a group of Pinterest experts, like 16 of us. And when we go around and talk about stuff, we're doing the same work, but we are totally different in how we deliver it, our personalities, our ideal clients, the niches that we're in in our business, and us sharing our the clients that are not a perfect fit with us and everyone sharing back is truly one of the biggest ways that I've grown my business. And again, you don't feel as lonely when we're hitting bumps in the road because we're hearing everyone in the industry is hitting bumps in the road for whatever reason it is. And it it makes you feel less lonely, less of a failure, and you get more ideas from them. I, I gosh, no one has said that yet on the podcast. Thank you so much for saying that. Now, oh, <laughs> I'm serious. Before it's a big one. It's a big yeah, one. This, this, this is a good, this is a great podcast. Um, but before we get to the gift that you are so generously sharing with the audience, 
Tell everyone that the services that you provide, because I know someone listening might be really resonating with what you have to say and might think, hey, I really need Sarah's help. So let everybody know what that is. Great. So um, I run a coaching program for solopreneurs, and I specifically focus on solopreneurs who are at what I refer to as a crossroads in their business model. Like we've talked about already, we all have different stages of our business. We're constantly in iterating and growing and changing and adapting our businesses. And if we're not doing that, we will fail. And so we all come to crossroads in our businesses. And those are the people that I focus on serving the most. You, The gift is, is the assessment that I built to help people understand what phase of business model oh, they are in amazing. and possibly where they need to go next. And on the homepage of my website, you can find out all the other things about me too. I have a sub stack. I write a blog. I also have a podcast. So um, we'll have all those links bound, down below. Her podcast is amazing. Her group is amazing. Like I definitely am excited by all of it and we'll definitely share it, including that gift. I'm really excited. So you answer a bunch of questions and it helps to tell you sort of what phase you're in in your business. Yep. So it's only eight questions. It's, so it's short and sweet. And then it will tell you what phase of there's sort of three phases they are in, but we all cycle through these phases. So there are only three phases, but we all cycle back through them over and over and over again. So it's better to think of it as a cycle instead of a straight line. And then it will tell you sort of based on the stage that you're in. And because you're there, you're probably feeling like you're at a crossroads. Maybe you're outgrowing that stage a little bit. What do you need to be thinking about next? And so this is where you are. These are some of the pros and cons of the stage that you're in. And if you're ready to move to the next phase, what does that mean? Amazing. I'm really excited for that. I know a lot of people will get a lot out of that. Thank you so much, Sarah, for taking time. Your advice is super valuable, but also your time is valuable. So we do appreciate you showing up for our community. If anyone listening or watching right now has found some ideas and some tips that could really help your business and that you can implement in your business, we'd love for you to leave a review because reviews are the lifeblood of what we do. Again, as I always say, go out there there and do something good for your business. Start by snagging Sarah's gift and then make sure that you block some time on your calendar to implement one thing you heard today. I know there's this thing going around about just getting 1% better every day. This is your chance to get 1% better by adding this time to your calendar for you to implement one thing that Sarah shared today. Thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me.